thank you very much uh, for inviting me here. Uh, and I thought, Speak up, Dr. Dan. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Hello? No, I don't think it's working. It's not working. Hello. Maybe... Uh, Hello. Just carry on, just speak just up, right. just speak up. Yeah, you'll be Sorry, I, just, it's just difficult. Uh, I apologize for uh, Paula Vigano, Professor Paula Vigano, uh, not able to be here. And, and I thank you very much uh, for inviting me to this event. And uh, uh, in the last two days, I learned an incredible amount of uh, knowledge from you. And today, I want to speak about uh, two things. One is Horizontal Metropolis as a general research that, um, led by Professor Paula Vigano in uh, uh, EPFL, Brazil. Uh, she is the uh, leader of the Lab U, uh, the, the laboratory of urbanism in EPFL, and she is also the uh, represent the responsible of um, the curriculum of urbanism in the PhD school in uh, IUAB. University of Venice. And the second part will be uh, about my progress in my PhD study. Um, the research of horizontal metropolis focuses on this dispersed uh, urbanization, this, uh, uh, let's say, the contemporary form of the city of today. And uh, um, we uh, do this research in three parts. The first is tradition, the second is mapping, the third is project, because in the end we are architects. And uh, for the tradition part, uh, yesterday, Benedict uh, already introduced uh, a lot. We see this long tradition on this kind of dispersion and so on. And, and uh, also in the United States, in Asia, in Europe, there are uh, this discussion happening now uh, globally and with this long uh, tradition. And the uh, different scholars uh, reflect on different uh, territories all over the world. And this uh, research of horizontal metropolis is also trying to um, put all of them together to compare, to let all the different authors to speak with each other. And so we are also building up uh, um, a book of uh, anthology of all the important uh, theories and uh, concepts. And as a studio, uh, we also do practice. So, um, I mean, Studio Segi Vigano, today, Studio uh, Paola Vigano. Um, I would like to show uh, briefly two projects. The first uh, um, project is uh, The Great Paris, um, 2030. We did this project in 2008. The project uh, was led by um, the French president Sarkozy at that time. Uh, when you see Paris, when you imagine Paris, you imagine a, a, a radio-centric uh, city. But when you see uh, the dispersion of university, the dispersion of um, monuments, uh, parks, you cannot recognize where is Paris in this territory. And also, if you reflect on uh, social uh, conditions, you see you don't see this uh, circular uh, shape of the city, but basically you see a very rich western part of Paris, and in the north part you have this incredibly poor uh, from Saint Denis, La Conneuve, La Boche, and so on. This uh, patch of uh, um, low-income inhabitants. So, um, as a concept, we try to um, break uh, the form of uh, Paris, uh, more reflecting on these conditions. So, we imagine continuities of um, densification, requalification, uh, along on some uh, natural uh, continuities, uh, green space, water, to f um, finally jump out of this old image of this uh, city. And each uh, <coughs> space could be um, developed into real uh, urban projects. The second uh, project I want to speak is uh, Brussels 2040. 
we did it in 2012. All these efforts are uh, kind of trying to contribute to this uh, uh, tradition. And you see uh, Brasso in the middle of this uh, egg, and here you have the basin of the mine. So here, uh, basically, you have the Flanders uh, area, and here you have the Walloon. And uh, from here, the pattern is more close to uh, France. But this part, uh, due to the uh, richness of the soil, and, and due to this fine uh, uh, and green um, agricultural production, it becomes very dispersed uh, uh, urban condition. When we are doing this, we compare um, Brasso, uh, this Flanders condition, with other metropolitan areas like Netherlands and, uh, and uh, Paris. We notice that a spe specific quality of this kind of sponge-like urbanization, that um, the open space per inhabitants are quite comparable uh, in between these three uh, metropolis. But the, the contact we call it the linear of contact, the uh, perimeter where the urban meets the open is incredibly long uh, in Brussels case. And we try to conceptualize uh, this territory. When we map all the urbanizations, we map all the uh, important elements, the grain, we, sh we see an uh, incredibly mixed and rich base and it's like a carpet, very very dense and this carpet is, you cannot see but this carpet is supported by a very fine uh, network of the rails and uh, water and on top you can find uh, figures like international uh, airports the EU quarter, the port of uh, Antwerp, uh, incredibly big the metropolitan parks and so on. So it becomes a, a new reading of the territory from first a base of urbanization, quite uh, evenly distributed, supported by a grid of uh, uh, water and the railways, and on top we have the figures. And as a, a project, uh, we try to work with this kind of uh, condition that we uh, conceptualize the city as a denser part of this grid instead of the islands floating on top of this grid. And the uh, Brussels become uh, one of this denser part. So the structure is complete, incredibly open. You see how the big grids are fitting with the small ones and this is a, a very conceptual. And uh, as we are pro uh, producing a vision, we want people to see. So we produce a really detailed uh, uh, model. We made a lot of these models to show how one uh, grid, one line could look like, what kind of quality it could be. And this, uh, we really like this uh, uh, way of working. And you will see later becomes a tradition of our uh, office. Okay, that was the tradition. Then we, uh, for the horizontal metropolis research in uh, Lausanne, we start to map different territories in the United States, in Europe, and in China. And we produce uh, maps uh, for each territory with the same category of themes. For example, uh, this is the water map of uh, the Neto region. And this is uh, the the forest uh, in Boston and you can see that uh, in the last 50 years uh, how a completely agricultural region was transformed into uh, a territory of forest it was a machine of, uh, uh, for living you can imagine uh, uh, enormous number of uh, uh, single family housing uh, housed inside of this forest so sometimes uh, showing the elements itself is uh, already a striking uh, thing for design. And uh, we also put uh, the historical maps. Uh, this is the Roman map. And uh, we also map uh, the transformation of the urbanity. For example, here you can see in, United, uh, uh, in the suburb of Boston, uh, 
from uh, 1960s to uh, today, how uh, the, the whole territory has been occupied. It's very similar to the work that uh, many people And we also compare the data uh, of uh, each case. And the third part is, pro is projects. We use a broad data city of uh, Frank Wright as a main reference. And we try to uh, build up new uh, type of broad cities. We use completely the same uh, dimension of the model, the same scale, the mm -hmm. same. We try to use even the same way of uh, presentation. Mm -hmm. Here you see the other five um, uh, uh, broad acre city models that we did. Uh, each model uh, is partly uh, a draw a drone and partly a physical model. And so this was the exhibition that we did last year in EPFL. Uh, first you have the introduction of the horizontal metropolis and then you have this uh, uh, area dedicated to all the theories everybody speaking about, uh, including uh, Professor McGee. And then you see the five models of uh, um, different territories together with the micro story on one side dedicated to every uh, yeah. place and you also have the drone video on the other side of every place. And this exhibition will be uh, brought to uh, Venice Biennale as a um, collateral uh, event. It will be uh, held on the island uh, just next to the, the main event. And uh, no need to say that everybody uh, here in this room is uh, invited. And if you pass by Venice during the uh, Biennale, please let us know. Uh, we can organize events, uh, discussion, debate, drinks. Uh, and also, I believe that uh, as far as I know, uh, AA School will also bring a group of students uh, to this island. So we can do something together. And the second part is uh, about my research on uh, China. Um, the Yangtze River Delta is a heavily built uh, territory. Um, in this territory we have the um, very uh, dense cities like city courts. We have relatively um, remote uh, villages, but really very uh, little, few. And the majority of the territory is built as a continuous uh, space, and I call it the, the third space. And, and the dense part of this uh, third space could be look, at, look like this, or look like this. Um, basically, you can understand it as a city. And if you take a train uh, from Hangzhou to Shanghai, you see this endless uh, uh, landscape like this. Um, and this kind of space is produced by an alternative process of uh, urbanization. The urbanization in Yangtze River Delta, uh, if you read uh, the, all the articles, all the um, literatures uh, on that, is mainly uh, divided into four stages. Uh, first is uh, the agri agriculture economy. Second part is the Maoi Maoist uh, era. After you have two type of, they are not two separate stages, they are more overlapped, but first uh, a more in situ urbanization followed by a city centered urbanization. And the agricultural economy. Uh, was described by uh, Fei, Fei Xiaotong, and uh, uh, Huang. And that um, the, agri the agricultural land is extremely productive, but it also demands incredible number of labor. And um, the result is uh, so-called involution, that the more you put uh, labor, the less production per labor uh, will occur due to the saturation of the productivity of the land. And that's why um, the 
the question is how to relocate the surplus labor. This is the main challenge of uh, Yangtze River Delta. Yangtze River Delta is not a typical delta, it's more like a bowl uh, with the uh, Thai lake in the middle. On the per periphery is in fact a bit higher. So it's incredibly difficult to drain this uh, uh, land. You have a, a very dense uh, canal and a, a water system, a river system to drain the land. Um, so this whole uh, area is supported by also water transport uh, for the commercial and industry uh, production. Even when the first railway was built, uh, still the uh, water uh, transport was the main support. You see all the important cities, uh, towns are uh, built based on that. And today, as Andrea also showed, that uh, is more or less what Fay uh, described in uh, 1930s. This uh, uh, incredible uh, dense uh, pattern of villages and 200, 50, 100 meters with each other, you can know. And in the Maoist uh, era, uh, in the beginning, he imagined something like this, a mixture of uh, uh, agriculture, so really, literally, a city in the field. And if you read him, you find a, a not similar, but even identical description of the life there with uh, Karl Marx, with the Lenin, with the, uh, the disurbanist uh, in the 30s in uh, Russia, like uh, Ginsburg or uh, Ohitovich, and even uh, identical with uh, the, descri the description of Radeke City by right. For example, um, everybody should be uh, free to do what you want. In the morning, you could be a farmer, in the afternoon, you are a scientist. Uh, but this kind of uh, life is supported by this kind of space that uh, it enable you to move uh, in between the different uh, professions. And uh, the exercise of uh, a commune, uh, as uh, Andrea was uh, describing, that was also um, inspiring uh, um, for, uh, scholars like Friedemann uh, for the agropolitan district development. Um, you even see the identical uh, size and population of the two uh, councils. And uh, uh, during the Maoist era, also the practice of this kind of uh, city in the field they left a uh, special uh, legacy, like this kind of uh, street uh, is um, built with a, a collective uh, interest and the, the industries were originally from the small industries inside the villages and so on. And the, I will do this very fast. The second stage is the in-situ organization. While the interesting is, in this part, the, the gap between the income of rural and urban was reduced. But from the 1990s, when the city-centered uh, urbanization took off, uh, in fact, the gap is back again. And uh, during that time, you see this kind of uh, really uh, industry in the village, uh, kind of uh, pattern. And uh, as everybody was speaking, uh, from the 90s and the, the 2000s, the city-centered uh, development become very, very strong. You see Kunshan from a very small uh, settlement become a relatively big city. And uh, um, they produce this kind of space with uh, industrial uh, parks with a very high density uh, of um, housing. And you see uh, some traces left from the agriculture, but you see, but uh, you cannot see. Um, if you uh, see a small um, part of this condition today, you see this uh, very dense um, uh, settlement, you see small industrial uh, parks, you also see uh, small industries uh, mixed inside of the villages. The villages, you cannot even see the division, they are all um, 
Here you see the housing, and uh, the red is the industry. And the industry is still growing, both in the industrial parks, but also in the uh, villages. And uh, in fact, we built incredible amount of housing. That, um, by incredible. That uh, um, today the inhabitants is more or less 1,000, 1,200 inhabitants for a square kilometer. Um, just for reference, uh, um, Roundstad is about 800, uh, Flanders is about 500. The city, the city that Frank Wright was describing in the Broadway city was like 600, and we are already the double. And with this amount of housing, we can house easily another dump. If you see uh, this house, uh, you see a ground floor that dedicated to a restaurant or whatever, and there is no, absolutely no staircase to uh, upstairs. The owner lives in uh, these two floors with a separate entrance. And on the back, you can see this kind of uh, uh, staircase that's not entering these two uh, floors for the owners, but directly to the upper two floors that uh, you can rent out. So, in fact, uh, in this uh, kind of uh, village, you have an incredible mix of different activities. It's already it's not rural. And uh, factories, uh, I don't have time to take it at this point. Okay, um, today the planning are very much focused on the cities and then um, there are a lot of practice to reactivate the villages but the idea is to make it uh, like, I don't know, uh, the, the rural uh, feeling that should be very beautiful, people are doing agriculture, we can go there to do tourism but you can see in this uh, kind of uh, condition nobody wants to go for today. So what is for this? And today, <coughs> for example, I take the, uh, the, the case that you saw was uh, um, on the north of Hangzhou and today it is under pressure because Hangzhou has to expand and to uh, uh, put population there. And and what is happening is um, they are rapidly uh, demolish this kind of uh, settlement and replace it with uh, this kind of uh, city that uh, you know. But if uh, there is this uh, tradition, if a uh, city in the field could be something valuable, why we cannot or even this city is existing, why we cannot eventually imagine the true city in the field instead of repeating uh, the old uh, way of uh, urban, urbanization. What is interesting is in Friedman's uh, description, he was referring to um, Switzerland, to Germany as uh, the perfect example of city in the field which is not so far from the, the picture that you saw. Um, my, my research is focused on the, uh, the elements of the desert world because Paula wrote a book of the city of elements, so I want to write the... <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you see the uh, industrial park and you see this incredible dispersed uh, organization well, uh, villages and the, the, the density of Panshi mm -hmm. and the Veneto mm -hmm. region are uh, comparable only we have five times more the inhabitants yeah. 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 and every village, even the density in every village is much higher than what we call already city in the Western countries. Yeah. Uh, I have to say something that 
the people there are working in uh, the local industries. The local industries are not hiring um, migrants. They are uh, for the local people. It's like what Friedman was describing in the ages. I think Kunshan and these large uh, industrial parks are something, and, but the vast territory is a different test. This is uh, my feeling after we can discuss about it. If you see uh, from the infrastructure point of view, it has a great potential to be a city. You see the incredibly fine uh, roads, network, and you see the dispersion of uh, uh, medical service, education, research. Uh, but in reality, a space could be like that, uh, as a public uh, service. And the, the waterfront could be something like this. In fact, the, the concrete is the basic material that we pour everywhere. But could be a fantastic place. And you see this uh, uh, space that created in the Maoist era, still today, is really beautiful. And you, you can find this, what can you say, incredibly beautiful uh, place to live. Um, if I can live there, I wouldn't miss it. Mm -hmm. And this uh, reading from elements is not new. Um, in, in Europe, there is a tradition from, in fact, a, a global a tradition from Venturi, from Agilgotti, speaking about the form of the territory and also the book of uh, Paradigano about the elementary city. And uh, my, uh, the reference I like most is uh, from <coughs> the fact that the construction of Brotherhood City is a construction from elements. Um, you can see this drawing and a list of elements that he was mentioning uh, together with the project. And for each element, he was very specific, even for a bridge, for a garden, for a, a small factory, how to have to achieve this uh, social uh, goal. And if you see the, um, the element, the road in, uh, um, in uh, China, the public space in China, uh, in the villages, and you see the road and public space in uh, a village in, uh, in Belgium. This is a, um, a village called Stabuk uh, that we did a competition there. And you see why this could be called a city in the field. That two minutes. Two minutes. <laughs> yes. yeah. Okay. Uh, you can imagine a lawyer, uh, a scientist, everybody can live in this kind of condition without any problem. But this one maybe not. So I don't have time, so I, I show you um, two, one, two elements that, uh, that uh, the first element is the water. Um, this was a map that Faye did in the 30s. Um, that you see, in fact, everything is water. Each uh, piece of land is like an island on top of the water. Um, and he was describing this kind of water management unit that was higher on the border, lower in the middle for the irrigation. And you see, uh, and you see uh, in Tamshi uh, area, uh, we show, we draw uh, all the, uh, these kind of uh, islands. You see the agriculture today are in the middle and the border is higher and dedicated for housing. And so you see the housing are border. And also, there is an incredible amount of uh, um, fish pond and uh, uh, orchards on the border of uh, the, the thing. And you see this kind of space. It could be very uh, beautiful. And when uh, Frank Wright was making uh, Broad Acre City, there was a big uh, nature uh, elements that a lot of the elements uh, were dedicated or related to this uh, figure. This is the figure. You see the school, the town center, the stadium are uh, located. 
So if we can, if we really want to build a city in the field, why we cannot imagine a continuity of green space could be public inside of this uh, this thing? So we did do exercises. We uh, the mineral surface. I have um, probably one minute. We study all the different type of mineral space. We make the, the mapping in detail. And the relation between the asphalt and the, the, the industry. And the, also, when Frank Wright was describing uh, Broadway the city, the roads was also incredible important elements. He was even designing the, the trees. The trees have to be perpendicular to the road, so when you drive, you see the openness instead of blocking it. <coughs> So we imagine a structural element of this asphalt uh, uh, street with the trees on both sides. Today still it is the case. And also um, a very uh, wide uh, space going east to west uh, as public space inside of this uh, city in the field. Chi, you need to finish up now. Okay. <laughs> Uh, so the broad acre city, uh, finally with a lot of other elements like uh, vegetable uh, gardens, uh, industries, blah, 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 we built up these first drafts of the broad acre city. This was the model. I show you some, some details. Okay, I finish. Um, the last uh, slide I want to see some. But if you look at Frank Wright, he was describing a society based on broad city. It was a, a manifesto. What Mao did was a manifesto. And what he was dis describing, whatever he did, what he was describing uh, about this life, this city in the countryside, was uh, very uh, charming, not, uh, provocative. And I think today, we, as I told you yesterday, Today we have to, uh, as an architect, to write a new manifesto to clarify what other things we would like to do. For example, if the future of the city would be a city that the school or located in the, the, the green space, as Frank Wright was speaking about. If everybody wanted to have a view, a small piece of uh, agriculture to cultivate, then I think this horizontal metropolis this kind of territory to be a city in the field could be the future.